What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. All right, moving on to our mailbag. First question. Jason, you're always so good at looking at the big picture stuff with basketball, not overreacting to individual games. I was wondering if there ever was a if there was ever a time where you would overreact to big losses like the Lakers just had, and if so, how you learned to be more patient. This is coming from a Warriors fan who has who was devastated after the Kings loss, but is now over the moon after the Clippers win. So here's the thing: I uh, when I was younger, I had the same feeling. Like I remember when I was like a teenager, late teenager like I would overreact to every single win and loss. You know what I mean? And it, it's kind of been like a steady decline from there. It really, you know, it's funny because I had this like, uh, I have this like, I, somebody pitched this theory to me the other day and I found it was really interesting. A theory having to do with age. Essentially like every year of your life is a smaller amount of your life proportionally as you get older. And so that's why it feels like time goes by faster because like if you're 20 and a year goes by, it's roughly what? 5% of your life, right? But if you're 40 and a year goes by, it's two and a half percent of your life, right? And so essentially it just feels like it goes by faster. And that's kind of like the the thing that's happened to me over the years with the NBA is like, the, the more NBA seasons that I've covered, the more NBA seasons that I've followed very closely as a fan, the more things I've seen, and it all just starts to feel smaller by perspective. And beyond that, we've just seen so many trends of, of the regular season games not mattering all that much in both directions with like teams like Sacramento and Memphis last year winning a ton of regular season games and then going out soft in the, uh, relatively soft, I should say, in the playoffs. And then teams like veter- older veteran teams struggling in the regular season and then succeeding when they get to the playoffs. I do think it's tough because uh, there is a lot of NBA history that shows that you'd rather be dominant. And a lot of times it is a, don- a dominant regular season team that ends up winning the title. But at the end of the day, like I think especially in this day and age with load management and how much more you know cautious teams are with injuries, it's more important to look at like if you see a night where your team is fully healthy and they're playing hard and everyone's kind of in a rhythm, but like they still get beat by a better team and there are specific trends you see on the court like, oh, they really struggle with this or oh, they really struggle with that. Make a mental note of it. But like specific regular season results, it's like, who cares? Like I, I guarantee you there are a lot of Warriors fans that are freaking out about this Clippers loss the other night. I watched that entire game. And I was uh, hanging out at my parents' house, actually. I went to go see them on Sunday and, uh, uh, or on, I guess it was Saturday. And I sat down and watched that game. And like, I thought the Warriors played great. You know what happened? Like the Clippers, for all of their issues, they have some really good players. And so they are capable of going on runs. And like, they just made tough shot after tough shot at the end of that game. And they got big stops. And, you know, like I thought the, the look Draymond Green got out of the corner is not a bad look. Kawhi Leonard's one of the best individual defenders in the world. It's not easy to get separation against him in, in terms of what happened with Steph on that possession. And so, like, my thing is, like, the Warriors have played a lot of good basketball in the last week. Between going up big on the, the Kings and going up big on the Clippers and getting the big win over the Clippers a few days before, like it's been a lot of good with some bad. And so I don't think it makes a ton of sense to overreact to to singular results like that when obviously we already knew the, the Warriors needed to make some sort of trade at the deadline to upgrade at that forward spot. It's been something we've been talking about ever since the Lakers series, right? So like, what really have we seen this year from the Warriors Warriors that is deeply concerning, right? Like Draymond's better than he was last year. Steph is Steph. Like Clay Thompson's been an issue. Yeah. And that's something that if, uh, although he's been playing better as of late, but if that becomes an issue in the long run, yeah, like maybe it's something they'll have to, uh, to do something about. But I even think that bringing in that type of forward slots Clay Thompson better and, and makes that sort of thing easier. pazemski has been incredible. It's been a godsend for that team. So like, again, I just... I don't really think it's worth it yet to have any sort of sweeping declaration about any team, right? And in general, like, you have heard the expression, cooler heads prevail? That's kind of the way that I feel like we should all act as fans during the NBA regular season. Like, after a big win, talk yourself down from it. After a big loss, talk yourself up from it. Try to stay even keel because that 82 can be ridiculous. Schedule losses are a huge part of it. There were so many schedule losses last week. Like, the... 
uh, uh, the Clippers beat the shit out of the Kings one night after they had this super emotional comeback win versus the Warriors. The the Lakers got shellacked on the tail end of a back to back in Oklahoma City. The um, I think it ended up being the Warriors beating the Clippers on the second night of a back to back. Like there, the schedule plays a big role. There's so many different things that can manipulate regular season results. And so in general, just try to pay attention to the basketball and pay attention to specific trends taking place on the court. Next question. Thanks for all your analysis on games and teams. I believe that Wemby is the real deal. What do you think is the next step in the Spurs process? A couple things. They absolutely have to, have to, have to get higher quality ball handling. All of the ball handling with San Antonio this year has been uh, has left a lot to be desired. As a fan, it's been really hard to watch San Antonio because of their process. They are fourth in turnovers. Excuse me, they have the fourth most turnovers per 100 possessions. They have the sixth worst pick and roll offense in the league right now. And they're the fourth worst spot up team in the league. So ball handling is a big part of it. Just decision making, getting Wemby in better spots and getting everybody in better spots. And then off ball shooting obviously is a big part of just the spacing going on around there. Um, but I think that's going to be something that they target after this off se- or this particular offseason because this year in particular has been a nightmare. Next question. As a fan of the show, I've heard you talk many times about how you believe young players can't be winning pieces coming to the later rounds of the playoffs. I agree with this take, but as a Warriors fan, I'm hoping Brandon Pazemski can be an exception in a limited role. Do you think this has some merit, or is it just my fan bias kicking in? Thanks, love the show. Off the bench, I think it's totally fine. It's like I've been talking about this with Lakers fans. Like, Can Cam Reddish or Max Christie contribute for the Lakers in the playoffs? Maybe off the bench. But I think if they're starting for you, if you're leaning on them for 30-something minutes a night, that's where it can become an issue. And so I think for a guy like Pazemski, who's clearly in, an, in a bench role, I don't think it's ridiculous to think that he can contribute in smaller minutes. So like Christian Brown con- contributed in, in smaller minutes for the, for the Nuggets last year in the postseason, right? So like again, this is all... Uh, the, to me, in the in those bench roles, it's not as big of a deal. It's like I'm more talking about like starting lineup or like sixth man, heavy heavy usage. Like that's that's where I start to worry about a, a player's age in the late rounds of the playoffs. Next question: Why is Victor not the defensive player of the year so far? He's the league leader in stocks, historic and absurd block rate, and he's asked to guard one through five. Teams are literally avoiding taking shots around him, and the Spurs have zero capable defenders with him. It's really simple. They haven't won enough games, and the defensive rating with him on the floor hasn't been that great. I think it's like right around like 115 or something like that, which is like good considering the personnel around him, but not that great, right? And that has literally nothing to do with Victor. It's just, to me, that award kind of associates or generally gets kind of directed towards a winning player in a winning situation. So I don't think it's a problem because Victor is going to get, I'm sure Victor will win several of them in his career. I just don't think he's going to get them this year. Next question. Do you think the Lakers should have LeBron run point? <laughs> so uh, the the whole expression like run point or this team needs a point guard to me doesn't really mean anything. It's just there's offensive initiators and playmaking finishers, right? Or, or play finishers, I should say, right? And so every team has multiple of them, right? And like right now, I do think it's a little convoluted with the Lakers between D'Lo and Austin and LeBron and Anthony Davis. But I do think they're going to end up consolidating that by getting rid of D'Angelo Russell at the deadline, which will simplify that process to Austin, LeBron, and Anthony Davis. Davis and you know if the, if there is a player that comes back in that deal like let's say it's a Jeremy Grant or a Laurie Markkinen or somebody like that if they end up getting a, a player like that that can score they're going to be scoring more in like ISO post up situations rather than pick and roll so I think it actually will fit in more cleanly with the way that that team plays and so again like do I think LeBron should take more control over the offense I mean yeah but I, I feel like he has especially in crunch time and he's been awesome in those situations so like to me given what the regular season is uh, you're just trying to get through the 82 games I honestly think the way they've been doing things is fine uh, from the standpoint of like a, a delineation of responsibilities, understanding that you have all these guards and, and like you have to play D'Angelo Russell until whatever time comes in the future where you decide to trade him, right? Uh, my only concern really has just been offensive organization. Like the, we talked about this at, to, at length, so I won't get into it right now, but stuff like the, the five out offense versus cleared side post-ups and, and, and cleared side ISOs and, and that sort of thing. I, I did notice in the Rockets game, um, if you guys remember, I did a breakdown 
after the Thunder game about different things the Lakers should be doing in the post, specifically cleared side post-ups for AD on the left side of the floor we can get to his right hand. And they ran, I want to say, I can't remember the exact number of post-ups, but they were 1.5 points per possession against the Rockets when AD posted up on the left block where he could get to his right hand. And then it was 0.8 points per possession on center and right block post-ups, which I thought was a strong indicator of that theory. It's just easier for Anthony Davis to read the floor and to get to his strong hand from the left side. And then LeBron um, ran, I think, uh, six... Or no, he ran eight post-ups in that game and either scored, passed to his score, or drew a foul on six of his eight post-ups, most of them out of that left block where he's most successful. So I thought that was an encouraging sign for the Lakers as well. Next question. For some reason, Ty Lue has a reputation as a good coach. Is that really justified? What has he done to earn it? If the Clippers' flow is so bad on offense relative to their skill, wouldn't it be good to have a coach do something about that? Ditto defense. Do I agree with everything Ty Lue's done? Not particularly. Like, he's a little... Oh, So here's the thing. Ty Lue's reputation, or Ty Lue's, Ty Lue's brand, I should say, as a coach, is he's big on, he's big on uh, um, uh, switching defense, small lineups, and he has excellent spacing principles, meaning like he is probably one of the better top two or three driving kick coaches in the league. And what I mean by that is like he's just he empowers his players to work in a spread floor and beat people off the dribble and play kind of freely from there. It's 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 brute force, but in a way that I think makes sense for the personnel that they have. The problem is is as they've gotten really small in this time post Harden trade. It's the the uh, all the switching and the going small, like uh, taking Zubak out of the lineup, has has put them into some precarious uh, situations. Uh, the, no, the numbers haven't updated since the last game, but or I haven't checked the updated numbers, I should say. But they were giving up an offensive rebound on almost half of opponent shot attempts uh, in crunch time since the Harden trade. That's like a huge problem in my opinion. So some of this thing is like a couple things. Um, is Ty Lue responsible for the offensive issues that they're having since Harden trade? In my opinion, no, just because it's just hard for a bunch of stars to learn how to play together. Also, there's so many egos in that room that they're going to kind of do their own thing in, in a lot of ways there, right? So, like, I try not to blame too much of that on the coach. Uh, it's, like, it's like when Lakers fans would blame Frank Vogel for offensive organization when it was a LeBron, Russell Westbrook, Anthony Davis team, and I wanted to be like, like, you think Frank is telling LeBron how to play offense? Like, those dudes are figuring it out on their own, and that's kind of what I think is happening with the Clippers. But that said, the uh, some of their defensive principles and some of their uh, lineup decisions that they've had post the Harden trade don't really match with the personnel, but it, it, we just have to see how it goes in the long run because, to me, the, the, the hallmark of a coach is how he responds to changes in personnel. You know, because that's the thing is every coach has, like, their kind of overarching belief system, right? But then you change personnel around that. And so, like, you kind kind of can't just inflict your belief on the personnel. You have to tweak your, your you know, kind of beliefs and system to your personnel, if that makes sense. Next question. How do you beat Denver? Also, do you think any roster in the league can consistently beat Denver in a series? As a Celtics fan watching the Nuggets, I just can't seem to find a way Denver loses if they're healthy. So Denver's the best team, in my opinion, which means, like, there is no team that can consistently beat them in a series, in my opinion. There are uh, there's two different ways to beat them, and if I if I was like trying to construct a basketball team to beat Denver, there's two different routes that I would I would look at. One is like spread them the hell out with five guys that can all dribble, shoot, and pass, and drive and kick them to death, so you can take adv- advantage of some of their limited defensive personnel. Team like Boston comes to mind as a team that could do that. Also, they just have a lot of rotation athleticism to be able to kind of fly around as they're working around the Jokic problem on the offensive end of the floor, right? The other two teams I look at are Miami and the Lakers. And the reason why I look at these particular teams is Anthony Davis and Bam Adebayo, in theory, if they are surrounded by the appropriate amount of athleticism, can uh, uh, can give Jokic and Murray problems, right? And the Lakers had... No success with that last year. That was a big problem for them. But I think like for both of those teams, for both Miami and the Lakers, they need to make a trade to kind of successfully unleash that. I like with Miami, the Jimmy Butler, Bam at a bio combination and their ability to guard the Jokic Murray two man game. If you guys remember in the NBA finals in game two, those two guys did an amazing job and did a good job slowing down Denver in that win, right? And so with Miami, they need more offensive firepower. So they'd need to make a trade to bring in enough firepower to to outscore Denver on the other end, right? For the Lakers, it's that one more... It's the guy that's like 
Because the problem is with Rui Hachimura, with Jared Vanderbilt, with Torian Prince, all those guys, Max Christie, Cam Reddish, they all have gaping flaws in, the, in, in with in, with respect to their ability to be in the starting lineup, right? Like Cam Reddish, Jared Vanderbilt, and Max Christie, it's can they be consistent enough offensively, right? And then uh, uh, Rui Hachimura and, and Torian Prince is are they athletic enough to kind of contend on the perimeter defensively, right? Like Rui's a good help defender, good rebounder, good post-up defender, good ISO defender, but he really struggles to navigate screens, right? And so all of those guys kind of have flaws. If they could bring in a Jeremy Grant or one of the Toronto Raptors forwards or a Laurie Markkinen or a Dorian Finney-Smith, a, a real dynamic starter caliber forward that's next to LeBron James and Anthony Davis, I think they'd have a better chance. But specifically, the Le- LeBron AD front line and the Bam Jimmy front line, I think are two front lines that if they were surrounded by enough talent could give Jokic and Murray some issues. But I'd put the Celtics at the top of that list for for right now with their ability to spread them out and drive and kick them to death. Next question. What I don't understand is that it took a small sample size of good basketball for Austin Reeves to get hyped into a big contract. How come a small sample size of bad basketball isn't enough for someone to change their minds? He had a decent playoffs and a couple of good FIBA games, yet people act as though he's been awesome for years and is just slumping for a few games. We've seen players in the past have a good season or two. If given the opportunity, tons of players would do it. Wow, I disagree with this. <laughs> if given the opportunity, tons of players could do what Austin Reeves does, but they don't have the opportunity. He's average at best, and he's not better than D'Angelo Russell. What are we even talking about? Wow, I don't think I could possibly disagree more with this comment. Uh, let me just, this is all I'm going to do for this segment. I'm just going to give you guys the real sample sizes here. 27 regular season games. 27. Regular season games. After Russell Westbrook was traded away from the Lakers, Austin averaged 17 points and five assists on over 70% true shooting. 16 playoff games. Austin Reeves averaged 17 points and five assists on over 60% true shooting, and he had eight 20-point games. He played 13 games with FIBA alongside a ton of talent and averaged 13 points per game on 77% true shooting. 78% in effective field goal percentage on catch-and-shoot jumpers, 61% in effective field goal percentage on pull-up jumpers, and 73% at the rim. That's how good he was at FIBA. Guys, that is a 56-game sample size of him being awesome. Not, like, good. Not even, like, great. Like, awesome. That's awesome contribution in, like, high-leverage games. That's, like... A playoff run in the NBA, right? The end of that regular season last year, every game was wildly important because they were trying to uh, scrap and claw their way into a playoff spot. And then literally for the World Cup of basketball. Like, it doesn't get much more high leverage than that. And for 56 games, he was awesome. And you guys are ready to call him a bum because he's been playing at a slightly lower level for 21 regular season games. 21. 21 to 56. That's the comparison of sample size. That's barely a third of the sample sizes of him being awesome. And this 21 regular season game sample, 14 points, five rebounds, five assists on 58% true shooting, which is good. It's certainly not as good as he used to be, but he's good. So like, again, the like Austin Reeves for a long extended period in high leverage games was awesome. So I am not going to jump off the Austin Reeves bandwagon after 21 regular season games when the Lakers were down most of their athleticism, which was a big part of why they were losing, and made everything harder on everybody else. All of a sudden, Austin is getting slotted on more difficult perimeter defense assignments, right? All of a sudden, just in general, the team doesn't have as much downhill rim pressure without the athleticism, which makes it harder on the perimeter initiators. In general, it's been a weird season, and he's still been pretty good. But like, yeah, stop Stop saying he was barely good last year. Stop saying he only did it for a few games. He didn't. For 56 games, he was awesome in a bunch of different circumstances. Like, And for, for two years before that, he was a quality role player working primarily off the ball. Like this is not, this is not, I, in my opinion, it's far more ridiculous to overreact to the 21 regular season games this year. Last question. Hi, Jason. How come the Timberwolves are better this year than last year? Last year, they had a stagnant offense, no spacing. Now they're cooking. There wasn't any offseason moves, so what's different? A couple things. First of all, I thought the Timberwolves were one of the better teams down the stretch of the regular season last year. I was super impressed by their defense and physicality, how how hard they played. They had kind of like a 
a weird offense in the sense that like it's a little clunky. It's a, the spacing is tough, but at the same time, they have a lot of different guys that can attack matchups in different ways. And so a couple things, they've ridden that defensive wave into this season. I predicted they'd be a top five defense this year. They ended up being the best defense this year. So it's just been a kind of like a more dynamic version of that. Right. And then Anthony Edwards has gone up a level starting from that awesome playoff series against the Nuggets where I thought he played really well to being the best player on the team at FIBA. And then coming into this season, his playmaking has gone up a level, his career high, 26 points per game. So just Anthony Edwards going up a level. Carl Towns buying in defensively and on the glass, which has helped anchor that lineup and made it so that that lineup makes more sense, right? In general, the whole team committing to the defensive end from day one of training camp. Those are kind of like the three things that are driving it, in my opinion. 